Welcome to the Off the Charts Football Podcast. I'm Matt Manicharian of Sports Info Solutions, joined as always by Aaron Schatz of Football Outsiders. Quick shout out to our researchers, Dandy Giuseppe and Keegan Abdu, for their great work this week. Aaron, big news going on. Carson Wentz is injured. Yeah, that is the big news of the week. And the question, of course, is how much it means. And that gets all into the whole MVP question and just how much of Philadelphia's improvement this year we can put on Carson Wentz's shoulders. Now, I happen to think that Nick Foles is one of the better backup quarterbacks in the league. As a starter, he would be lacking. But as a backup, he's pretty good. So I think that the Eagles lose something here, but not as much as you think. You got to throw out that year that Foles was insane with only two interceptions, total flu. You also have to throw out the year he played with the Rams, because I think as we've seen with Case Keenum and Jared Goff, that Rams offense was horribly designed. So what you get in the middle is a quarterback for the 2014 Eagles who had about an average DVOA and was actually really good running the ball. One of the surprising things about Foles is he's a pretty good runner. You could do zone read with him. What you probably can't do with him is the kind of awesome scramble plays where he would, you know, Carson Wentz would just make something out of nothing. That's what's going to be missing from the Eagles. Yeah, Foles certainly going to be more of a doing things on time thing. I think you bring up a good point with him running the ball because he did run the Chip Kelly offense before. And even though he's not the greatest athlete on the field, he's shown an ability to be effective. I mean, we said throw it out, but 27 and two is pretty good. Um, and that was and that was in his own read system that he was throwing out of there. That said, as as good as I think um, Nick Foles is for a backup, it's really tough. You when you lose your MVP candidate and you've got to have your backup quarterback taking you through the gauntlet that the NFC playoffs appears to be. Yeah, everything for the Eagles now depends on two things. One is that defense that's number three in the league in DVOA and has improved over the second half of the season. The other is home field advantage, because the Eagles get home field advantage right now in 91% of our simulations, because they've got the game lead on Minnesota, they've got the head-to-head on the Rams, they've got the common opponents tiebreaker over New Orleans and Minnesota. So that home field advantage is, is a really good thing for them, and that might allow them to overcome the fact that without Wentz, they're not as good as the other top three teams. In the NFC, we still have Philadelphia as the favorite to make it to the Super Bowl from the NFC. Right now, they make it in 29% of our simulations compared to 23 for the Rams, 18 for the Saints, 21 for the Vikings. So that home field advantage is really valuable, but that's really what they have to depend on now. Well, the Eagles play the Giants this week, and that's certainly not going to be one of the top games that everybody's got their eye on this weekend. But what are the most important games of the week? Well, the number one game of the week for making the playoffs is almost a play-in game at this point, and that is the Saturday night game between the Los Angeles Chargers, which is still weird to say, and the Kansas City Chiefs at Arrowhead Stadium trying to screw up everybody's Saturday night date plans. Chiefs are in the playoffs 95% of the time if they win this thing, but only 40% if they lose. It's even more important for the Chargers, who go to the playoffs 75% of the time if they win, but only 15% of the time if they lose. So first of all, what were your Saturday night day plans? I'm dying to know. What does Aaron Schatz do on a Saturday night? Well, divorce, man. It means you're back on the market. (laughs) When you said divorced, at first I thought you said the force, and I was going to say me too. I'm going to see Star Wars on Saturday. No, 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 that's a different market. But I, I think I would choose Chargers Chiefs over the movie because you can see the movie anytime. Yeah, I'll, maybe I'll make it an afternoon show. Anyway. The force, of, the force in this game is going to be the running games because the Chiefs and Chargers are both so weak on run defense. Yes, and part of the reason for that might be that they both play a ton of defensive backs. So allow me to drop some dimes on the dime sets that we can expect to see. The Chargers play with six defensive backs on the field on 42% of their defensive snaps. That's the second highest rate in the league. The Chiefs are number three at 41.6%. League average, meanwhile, is just 13.9%. So it's a huge difference there. Now, the Chargers mainly run that out of a 3-2-6 set, and they run that set at the highest rate in the league by far at 27% of their defensive snaps. The Chiefs run a 2-3-6, and they run that at a 31% rate, which is second in the league. So you can see a ton of time these both these teams play in the dime set. 
Unsurprisingly, overall, six defensive back personnel groupings leave defenses more susceptible to the run game. Makes sense, right? 5.5 yards per carry and 2.7 yards before first contact per attempt with six defensive backs on the field compared to the league average on all plays, 4.1 yards per attempt and just 1.6 yards before contact. However, the Chargers are a lot more successful at stopping the run when they're playing out of their dime. They've, they're allowing only 4.9 yards per carry with six defensive backs, whereas the Chiefs allow 6.5 yards per carry with defensive backs. Also, they're better against the pass when they're in the dime. They allow six and a half yards per attempt, fourth in the league, and the Chiefs allow 6.9 yards per attempt. Still pretty good at seventh in the league. Now, the good news for the Chiefs is that Alex Smith has been electric against six defensive back looks this year. On the third most attempts in the league, 112, he ranks first in yards per attempt at 9.1 and first in passer rating by a full 10 points at 112.2. Big part of the reason for that, Tyreek Hill and Kareem Hunt have excelled against six defensive backs. Yeah, I think when you go back to the first meeting of these teams, now that's way back in week three. But after the Chargers had uh, the very close losses with the missed field goals in the first two weeks, this was a substantial loss, 24 to 10. However, both running backs played really well. Kareem Hunt, 17 carries for 172 yards. Melvin Gordon, who's averaged less than four yards a carry this year, had 17 carries for 79 yards and a touchdown in this one. So I think you're going to see a lot of running in this game. Uh, the pass defenses have been much better than the run defenses for both teams, but the Chargers' pass defense has been far better overall than the uh, than the Kansas City pass defense. And what's really remarkable, I think, is the way the Chargers have come on over the last few weeks. So check this out. Since week nine, so that is a, a six-week period, the Chargers are the number one pass offense in the league and the number two pass defense in the league. And we know – that, you know, unlike what they say about the 70s, you win in the NFL by passing and stopping the pass. And that is what the Chargers have been doing over the last six weeks. Yeah, they're playing really good football. Crawled all the way out of the gutter. A guy that deserves mentioning is Desmond King for the Chargers. He's been targeted on only 7% of pass snaps that he's on the field. And he allows a completion on just 4.76 percentage of pass snaps. Just unbelievable numbers there. One guy who we can expect to see him on a decent amount of the time is Tyreek Hill. And I want to give everybody a heads up going into the game. Watch out for where Tyreek Hill lines up. He lines up wide or in the slot about equal percentages of the time. 45% wide, 49% in the slot. A little bit in the backfield. Now, in terms of targets, he's had 53 targets wide and only 37 from the slot. 37 completions compared to 26, 654 yards out wide compared to just 321 when lined up in the slot. Also four touchdowns to two picks. So he's done much more of his damage when he's lined up out wide. So keep an eye. That's an alert when you see Tyreek Hill line up as the wide receiver as opposed to the slot. One of the other important trends to watch in this one is the whole red zone issue because both of these offenses have really slowed down in the red zone. Uh, the Chargers are the 10th offense overall in DVOA, but 28th when they hit the red zone. The Chiefs are 6th overall, but dropped to 19th in the red zone. And uh, while the Chiefs' are, defense is about the same, the Chargers have the number one red zone defense in the league by DVOA. So the Chiefs are probably going to need to get those long touchdowns because they are going to have a problem getting those short touchdowns. Yeah, really interesting stuff there. Uh, not sure exactly what to make of those splits, but um, definitely food for thought. Let's go ahead to the most important game of the week for Super Bowl odds. What do we have going on this week? Well, I don't think anybody would be surprised as the most important game for the Super Bowl. It is the battle, essentially, for the number one seed in the AFC between the New England Patriots and the Pittsburgh Steelers. The Patriots go to the Super Bowl 37% of the time if they win this game, 23% if they lose. The Steelers, 41% of the time with a win, 31% of the time with a loss. Of course, the Patriots were higher in our odds than the Steelers until the Monday night debacle. That dropped them down a little bit. In fact, uh, the Patriots now drop to the number three seed in a third of our simulations because if they lose this game, it's very likely they end up tied and losing a tiebreaker to the Jacksonville Jaguars. So you talked about the Monday night debacle, and I wanted to 
look into that a little bit. First of all, I'm not sure if you thought that was cause for concern or, or just a blip and Gronk's back and the Patriots will roll. I tend to think it's mostly the latter. But the one thing that I would be concerned about is Tom Brady. And he did not look like himself playing. And I think, oh, and I think no. it might have had to do oh, with a little bit of an injury possibility. And he's been on the injury report, um, I think, two of the last three weeks with an Achilles and since he's been listed on the injury report, his stats, a little bit of a dip, down to 62% for just 718 yards over those three games, five touchdowns and four picks. And we all know what his astronomical numbers were before that. Is that cause for concern for you? Or you just think, you know, as long as he stays away from strawberries, everything should be good to go? Yeah, man, the avocado really turned the worm this week. Uh, I would be a little bit concerned. And here are the reasons why. Number one... Uh, the Achilles. Number two, they really miss Marcus Cannon on the right side, and Cannon is now on IR. He is not coming back. And Adrian Waddle was okay in his stead, but Waddle has been injured, and Cameron Fleming is the third string, and he is terrible. The other thing I would say is, while I have never done the research, Kian Fahey has done some research on quarterback accuracy for older quarterbacks that shows that older quarterbacks do tend to lose accuracy late in the season as they tire. This was not a problem for Brady last year because of the suspension. I would be a little worried that it's a problem for Brady now. That being said, the quarterback on the other side of this game is also an older quarterback. So if older quarterbacks lose a little bit of accuracy late in the season, that should be a problem for Ben Roethlisberger, just as it's a problem for Tom Brady. Because even though Roethlisberger is younger than Brady, he still qualifies as an older quarterback. So with Gronk coming back, do you think that'll help solve the Brady crisis late in the season? Well, in this game, I don't know if it will, because here is a surprise. The Pittsburgh Steelers are the number one defense in the league in DVOA when covering tight ends. Um, as far as yards per game, the yards per game, uh, it's only slightly better than average, but they've got some picks against tight ends. And they have the number one DVOA in the league once you adjust for the tight ends that they've played. So I don't know if this is the big Gronk game. However, Gronk opening things up for other players is a definite possibility because there was just nothing going on in the middle for the Patriots against Miami with no Edelman and no Gronk. You, you bring Gronk back, now you've got to cover the middle. And also the running backs obviously were a huge part of the passing game against Miami. And Pittsburgh is 29th in the league covering running backs in the passing game. So this looks like a bigger Deion Lewis Rex Burkhead game than it does a Gronk game. But Gronk as a decoy will be really important. So I want to talk about the matchup that we talked about last year going into the AFC championship game. And that was the Steelers pass defense against Tom Brady and the Patriots passing offense and how that has been a historical mismatch and it continued to be one in that game. Um, we even went on to talk about before the Super Bowl last year. I remember you talked with Scott Spratt and we had pulled some research about how Tom Brady was much better against a man cover two than he had been against any other scheme. And he was, um, excuse me, much worse against a man two and much better against cover three than against any of the schemes that he went against um, at least a hundred times last year. And what we've continued to see going, going forward is that Brady is much better against the cover three than he is against the two man. We saw it in the first half of the Super Bowl. The Falcons came out with a lot of two man and it was very effective. And for some reason they dropped back into the zone in the second half and Brady went to work. Now this year, Unsurprisingly, the Steelers run the cover three the most in the league. They have 177 snaps where they've played cover three this year, which is the most. And Tom Brady has the second best passer rating against cover three in the NFL. He's got an 113 rating when he goes against cover three. So we're seeing the same pattern again, the same one that we've seen when the Steelers have faced the Patriots in the past the same pattern that we saw in the Super Bowl, and we've seen it developed over the course of the year this year. Now, Pittsburgh has actually been better in man than in zone this year. They have a slightly better completion percentage against yards per attempt allowed when they've been in man. So maybe there's a chance that we see the Steelers 
change the script a little bit and go to some of that man with the two high safeties, especially. Um, we saw the Dolphins do a lot of that last week and were very effective with it. I'd like to see that. Or will it be that the Steelers stay stubborn? They stay with their cover three stuff. Because if they do, I think injured or not, Tom Brady will sit back and have a field day. Yeah, also what the Dolphins did was a lot of cover one with a rover. They did a lot of sticking a rover short in the middle of the field to take away those short crosses and whatnot, uh, as well as some of those running back passes, or trying to at least, take away some of the running back passes. And, and, and yeah, look, Brady eats this defense alive. He always eats this defense alive. I don't see any reason that will change. So what this game comes down to is, will Roethlisberger keep up? And it will be easier this year for two reasons. One, the Patriots defense has struggled, although the Patriots defense is much better in recent weeks. In fact, since week nine, the Patriots have the number eight defense in the league by DVOA. And yes, that includes the Miami debacle. Uh, the, the other problem is that in past games, they've never had all of the Steelers offense together against the Patriots, right? Last year, for example, regular season, no Roethlisberger. Postseason, Le'Veon Bell gets injured very early in the game. This year, they should have everybody unless there's some kind of freak injury again. And you know there's not going to be any pressure. Steelers are number two in preventing pressure by the SIS charting. The Pats are 31st in pressure rate. There will be no pressure on Roethlisberger whatsoever. So if ever there's a game where he was going to keep up with Brady, this is it. But he's got to keep up with Brady because they are not going to stop him. Interesting take there. I agree with you, obviously. Antonio Brown, Le'Veon Bell, those are the guys that are, I mean, they're just unbelievable. They, they keep playing, doing amazing things. Um, really a gift to watch those guys play. I do disagree, though. I, I've got some, some faith in the Steelers' defense. I think that they've improved their pass defense this year from what they were. And if they can, if they can free themselves of their stubbornness a little bit and go to some more of that man stuff, I think, I think we might see them have some success. Uh, first of all, just to apologize, the number I just gave for the Patriots was the Patriots' pass defense has gone from 30th to 8th. Their run defense is still terrible. Also, the Pittsburgh pass defense has fallen apart just as the Patriots' pass defense has gotten it together. The Pittsburgh pass defense has gone from 5th to 22nd since week 9. So that's the problem is, yet the Pittsburgh defense had been playing so well. But, I mean, I think we saw last week against Baltimore, guys just getting completely lost on coverage. And you throw those zones out there and then get completely lost on them, Brady will eat you alive. Well, I, I love that as a uh, transition because you talk about people getting lost in zone. And it brings us right into our third game that we're going to discuss, a little bonus most important game of the week. And it involves the Seahawks and the Rams. So give me the percentages first, and then I'll talk about what I wanted to talk about, the Seahawks' zone defense. Sure. The Seahawks are in the playoffs 64% of the time if they win this thing, 18% if they lose. For the Rams, it's much more important for seeding for the Super Bowl chances. They are in the playoffs 99.8% of the time with a win, 89.5% with a loss, but they go to the Super Bowl 27% of the time with a win and only 16.5% with a loss. So, recently, we have not equated porous zone defenses with the Seahawks. They have been famous for their cover three recently. They're changing the way the teams have played it all over the league, um, and it's obviously been Legion of Boom a strength for them. This year, however, the Seahawks have been playing more man than zone. Very surprising if you've been following them for the past few years. We've got them at 49% of their snaps in men and just 36% in zone. Now, the really surprising thing is why they've been doing that, and that's because they've been much more effective in man than zone, the biggest split that we've seen in the league. Their completion percentage against in man is at 50.4%. In zone, they're giving up 68.5%. Yards per attempt, 6.2%. In man, 8.3 in zone. Their passer rating is 20 points worse in zone than in man. And the Seahawks are now becoming a man team. There are so many stats I can give that match what you just said from the DVOA perspective. And I am just dumbfounded by what's going on with the Seattle defense. Obviously, no Richard Sherman, no Cam Chancellor, but Earl Thomas is still there. 
and yet they're not playing very Earl Thomasy. So check this out. Seattle has been awful against wide receivers this year, yet they've been the number one defense against running backs in the passing game, which is, of course, interesting here because of how much the Rams throw to Gurley. Here's another one. Although Bobby Wagner was probably a big part of it. Yeah, and if Bobby Wagner misses this week, that'll be a problem. But, I mean, you want to see the effect of losing Sherman and Chancellor. Seattle, number eight in pass DVOA defense through week nine. Since week 10, 27th in pass defense DVOA. So their defense has gotten worse, even though the run defense has improved from 20th in the first half of the season to second since week 10. They've overall gotten worse because the pass defense has gotten worse. And here's one more that's really important about playing the Rams. We know that nobody uses more play action than the Rams except perhaps the Minnesota Vikings. Seattle, ninth in the league against non-play action passes, six yards per pass. 22nd against play action passes, 7.7 yards per pass. So the play action has been a, a bugaboo for them. That could be a problem matchup-wise going into this one. I mean, it's a play action and then the deep throw. And if Earl Thomas – Earl Thomas can cover a lot of ground, but you can find some ground where Earl Thomas isn't. And if you find that ground, the other players that Seattle has in the secondary right now are just not as good as they used to be when they had Sherman and Chancellor out there. I don't think there's any debating it. All right, Aaron. Well, you wanted to keep it quick this week. We got a quick one in and out, and we'll sign off. A reminder to subscribe and rate us wherever you find your podcasts. We're on Twitter at SportsInfo underscore SIS and at FB Outsiders. Have a great weekend of football, and we'll see you next week.